day 172 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russian occupation of Ukraine. Chelsea here, and today is another update as I take a bit of a simplified and down-to-earth approach to the happenings on the ground in Ukraine. And as always, I like to start off with some of the Russian military losses. So again, always take it as a bit of a grain of, with a bit of a grain of salt. It is an estimate, but it is what it is. And uh, the troop losses uh, today have hit an estimated 43,550 there. Other notable losses include a mouth water in eight tanks and five drones, which I'll show you something about there shortly, and uh, 11 armored protected vehicles. So moving across to the map here, and what we might actually do is start outside of Ukraine again and have a look at Belarus. So there have been some satellite images of the uh, Belarus airfield here, where following a couple of explosions from yesterday. Now we don't know exactly for sure uh, the reason for why it happened, but we do have some photo imagery of it. But if, the Russian propaganda machine blames one more thing on somebody smoking. I'm going to lose it. Anyway, moving across to uh, something within the Ukrainian borders there. So the, the Sumy uh, Oblast, or the region here, was actually uh, had a, a number of shells uh, in the from Russian forces about 15 times in the last 24-hour reporting period, but uh, no casualties were reported, so that's good to see there. Then we move across to uh, Kharkiv. A bit of continued shelling in this region here as well. Hitting mostly non-military related targets. Some analysts now call it indiscriminate shelling. I think it's that, and I also like to think it's uh, the use of older and less accurate Soviet era artillery systems that uh, Russia has to use. They've got a lot of that stuff left over, and sometimes that's all they can use. But uh, that uh, attack was repelled as well. And uh, moving across down to the, the, the Donbass region. Now, just generally speaking here, uh, Russians, Russia's best efforts seem to manage only the slightest Donbass gains. So it's pretty well known that Russia wants to take the remainder of the Donbass region to claim some sort of military victory. In fact, I talk about it a bit, but it doesn't hurt to draw it. So this is the remainder of the, the Donbass region. It's actually the, the Donetsk uh, Oblast there from the Donetsk city there as well. But uh, yeah, certainly would love to take that and have been unable to uh, to date. Now, uh, we'll start off a little bit further up north in the... Have a, just a quick chat about the Izium region. A uh, bit of push and pull here. As you can see, there's liberated areas and there's taken areas if you go back and forth on the days of the map. Nothing in the last 24 hours. But you've probably uh, heard of the city Izium uh, quite a bit there before. And why is this important? Uh, the city, well, it's mostly because Izium is an important transportational hub. So that includes access to various highway infrastructure and uh, things like railway infrastructure there as well. So both sides want to hold onto it and keep it for further advances on either side there effectively. Now moving a little bit further down to the Slavyansk uh, city there, Russian ground assaults uh, actually from the northwest of Slavyansk. So I might actually need to pull up there a little bit and have a look. But um, around here, Pasika, that's the one there where the Yoinki Pig is. Uh, that stands for a Russian military uh, infantry, effectively. Though it was repelled and the process destroyed two Russian military trucks. Uh, so we've been advised there. Moving on just generally to the east, no specific details here, but uh, Ukraine shot down a Russian Su-25 jet. And this is kind of like an older jet. It's not super maneuverable like the newer ones, but uh, Ukraine also destroyed four Russian Orland 10 drones. The drones were shot down by a, a UK donated Ukrainian Stormer HVM. And here's a more high res image here. 
And interestingly, when Ukraine inspects the shot down Russian drones, they find a whole bunch of Western parts in them, whether it's silicon chips from the USA or infrared sensors from France, which is now very difficult for Russia to replace, given that Russia is most heavily, the, really the most heavily sanctioned country on earth. They're even more sanctioned than Iran now. And Iran used to be, uh, for years, was the, the poster child uh, of, of economic sanctions placed on it. So that, that's a big deal. So it's going to be hard for the, the military industrial complex of Russia to and their procurement and production locations to, to really replace things that have been lost because they're, they're just running out of parts effectively to, to replace these sorts of equipment. Now, moving down to the, the Bakhmut region, uh, of course, this is a very, very highly contested area, as I say. Russian forces are shelling multiple settlement, uh, settlements in the region. Uh, 20 residential buildings here uh, were reported as damaged. What Russia is doing there is effectively taking these small villages here. So Kadima, Veseladonia, and there was another one by a different name. Think around here and there but uh, what it appears what Russia is attempting to do is of course push forward there to take this what they would consider a, a nice military supply line all the way to Bakhmut uh, but yeah haven't taken it yet uh, small gains but but nothing really to speak of they took this area yesterday so a bit of a gain there now let's see in lower Donbass a bit of news to report here let's see Pisky so the outer village of Pisky I, I call it an outer suburb of the Donetsk city there now if we go back and forward in the the time map we'll see that they actually did take the majority of Pisky there not all of it but most of it uh, so let's see now they've Russia's actually been attempting to take Pisky uh, village of Pisky since the beginning of the the invasion they've finally taken most of it which I did expect, but uh, I, I can really only imagine the amount of Russian military hardware and personnel losses utilized to take this position. And they haven't even taken all of it, and it's been a long, long time trying to, to do this. Uh, the Russian forces attempting to, to take it all. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I guess it is what it is there. Now, let's see, moving across to Dnipro, or the Dnipro Oblast, really. So, we've got the Dnipro city of which we've got the Dnipro Oblast there, the state, province, whatever you want to call it. Russian forces shelled some districts within uh, the Dnipro uh, Petrovsk uh, Oblast, actually is the name for it. Uh, now this isn't exactly front line. Uh, if I was to zoom out, you can see the front line in uh, Melitopol Oblast is much further down, but uh, still happens from time to time where they take out some, or attempt to take out some positions here and there around the districts. Okay, so let's see if I can move back down. Here we go now. Zaporizhia is no stranger to getting quite a bit of press uh, here for for the Russian shelling of the nuclear power plant. And there are now some new reports of Russian troops shelling the nuclear power plant, which is right there, uh, to, to cut off Ukraine's south from electricity. And this is actually pretty consistent with photos that came out about a week ago now of power line infrastructure being damaged. Now, the Ministry of Defense for Ukraine said this is a typical false flag operation by the Russians disguising a self-propelled artillery uh, as Ukrainian. And no doubt we'll continue to hear more about this as the days, weeks, and etc. go on there. But in fact, on the topic of, of that there, Nikopol. So Nikopol right here. Russian forces are continuing to fire at Nikopol overnight. And it's been said that it's happening from behind the power plant. So we've got the power plant here, and they're just going from behind the power plant there, which is a bit of a cover for them. So to be honest, that's is a bit of a dick move from the Russians to, to do it, hide themselves or protect themselves from the, the nuclear power plant there. Which it's, it's just... Uh, I won't get into that there. Uh, next up, we have the Melitopol area. There have been some reports of explosions around the uh, north eastern part of it, somewhere here. It doesn't say exactly, 
but it may have been a, a supply depot from what we understand. Uh, this is of course Russian occupied territory as well. And moving on to the Kherson region. Now let's probably zoom in a little bit here. There were some more loud explosions reported uh, overnight in the Nova Kokovka region there, just below the, the dam, the bridge, the, the railway line. And apparently there was a, uh, a supply depot that was uh, taken out there. Now here's the thing, there is a bridge here, here, and here to support the Russian front line all the way up there. Now, these are all being taken out by by Ukraine, uh, quite constantly really. Ukraine, uh, UK intelligence support, uh, advises that even if Russia repairs the bridges in the, in the Kherson Oblast, they will remain a, a key vulnerability. So in other words, I guess this is something we already know, but if Ukraine hits the bridge, Russia will repair it, but then Ukraine will just hit it again. So it's of no use to support, uh, it's not of a lot of use, I'll say, to support all of their frontliners all the way up there, so Russian uh, frontline offensive. So it's, yeah, it's it's not, it's a bit of a sandboxing event, in my opinion, for Russian forces. They can get light infantry, or sorry, not light infantry, but light vehicles across this, this uh, bridge, dam bridge here, but they can't do a lot there these days. Certainly not tanks, for instance, there. Okay, I'll clean up the screen a bit there. But uh, let's see. So moving on to a bit of news. So... Uh, actually, this is part of the news too in the Kherson region. Russian military command has left the front line of the uh, Kherson offensive there, the Russian Kherson offensive. So they're effectively fleeing from the front line as the reports go. Now, here's the thing. About 14 Russian commanders have been killed during the war in Ukraine, which is not very good because the loss of even one or two commanders is considered to be quite rare, even by World War II standards. And this has been attributed to Russian senior commanders going to the field to address difficulties in command and control and faltering Russian performance on the front line. There's many stories of commanders basically going to the front line to try to fix the issues with Russian troop advances, sometimes with success, apparently a lot of the time without success. But this is certainly not good press for Russia either way with uh, Russian commanders fleeing the front line, which they're meant to be sort of pushed at by the, the top of the autocracy, uh, I believe, all the way to the top, such as Putin saying, get those commanders to the front line to, to fix these issues. We're not pushing forward enough, that kind of thing. A lot, there's a lot of information online about that there. Okay, uh, further in the news, so two cargo ships have left the Chorno-Morsk port, which is just below Odessa, so it's right there. There's a port, of course, in Odessa there as well, and another couple there. And this includes corn and sunflower seeds, but it's just good to see a steady flow of, uh, of outage of, uh, of, of grains going to other countries there now for few food security reasons. Moving across to some more news outside of the country, Slovakia, which actually shares a border with Ukraine, as you can see there. Now, they have actually delivered four Zizuna howitzers to Ukraine. Now, this is a self-propelled artillery system. What this means is that more and more NATO standard artillery is making its way to Ukraine, helping to alleviate the supply issues with Soviet era ammunitions that Ukraine is mostly running out of there. Uh, further on with a bit of news here, so Russia is readying itself for a prolonged war with Ukraine. A new Russian budget is reportedly available that would boost the industrial spending by ten billion dollars uh, to supply to support war efforts in Ukraine. Now, to put that into perspective, Russia's annual military expenditure is about the same as France or the UK, and is only about double uh, that of countries like Australia and Canada. So they actually don't spend a great deal. It's a bit more nuanced than that, uh, just the way that their GDP per capita works and, and how that plays into it all, but uh, they don't spend a great deal. Having said that, um, 
when they do have a, a caliber missile expenditure, it's going to cost them about a, a million US a hit. And that's why they don't use their highly guided uh, caliber missiles that too much. A, they don't have many. B, it's expensive. C, they they just want to use grunts on the ground, orcs as some people call them, in many locations uh, because that's that's what they've got a lot of. Uh, but uh, it's certainly more nuanced than that. I won't get into too much more of that in there for now. And uh, usually I end off with a bit of lighter news. Uh, this isn't so much news, but it is a bit of a, a funny to end the day. Uh, plenty of memes are going around at the moment, making a bit of fun of effectively Russian face-saving propaganda about the excuses they use for military bases or ship losses uh, due to explosions. So... Uh, like I said before, I'm going to lose it if they use that excuse again, people smoking. But um, it's still a little bit funny. <laughs> but my patience is wearing thin on the funniness. Uh, they need to come up with better excuses, in other words. So thanks for watching, guys. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button. Definitely hit that like button to show your prevailing sentiment and support for Ukraine, as of all the trolls that you'll always see down below there in the comment section. But thanks again, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.